listening to the Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Wilmer Leon, joined here by my co-host Garland Nixon. Thank you, Wilmer. TASS reports U.S. facing new global reality post Xi Putin summit. According to Helga Zepp LaRoche, Western establishments, quote, are still completely underestimating the reality that there is a powerful renaissance of the non-aligned spirit occurring right now, end quote. For insight into this, we turn to our next guest. He holds the John Jay and Rebecca Morris Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's one of the most prolific writers of our time. His latest book is entitled The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery, Jim Crow, and the Roots of American Fascism. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, welcome back. Thank you for inviting me. So in an interview with TASS yesterday, Zepp LaRoche, the founder of the U.S.-based Schiller Institute, said that China's peace proposal is not only endorsed by Russia, but is supported by the entire global South. The initial reaction of Biden was to reject it, as did some other leaders of the EU. But it is now becoming clear to the whole world who is trying to establish peace and who is trying to prolong and escalate war. Zepp LaRoche emphasized when asked whether the Chinese leader's visit to Russia could usher in peace in Ukraine. First of all, I, I think that line in, in terms of who's trying to establish peace and who's prolonging and escalating the war, that's been very obvious for a number of decades. But with that being said, your thoughts, Dr. Horn? Well, first of all, with regard to the prospect that we are on the cusp of a new world order, that weighty and profound sentiment needs to be considered very seriously. This will lead to an upset of many existing arrangements. And what bothers me and what worries me incessantly is that the North Atlantic powers led by the United States may decide on a riverboat gamble. That is to say, rather than see China surge ahead in the passing lane, accompanied by Russia and their allies, they would rather seek to wage war. I think that that is already happening with regard to the proxy conflict in Ukraine. And even though the commentators on this side of the Atlantic have suggested that the point that Russia has not yet been able to overcome altogether Ukraine is a demerit on Moscow. The other way to look at it is that Russia has been able to stand up to the United States and dozens of its allies with regard to this proxy war. And that does not necessarily bode well for the North Atlantic countries, which may lead them to try to throw the dice with regard to waging war in China, perhaps with Taiwan as a trigger, just as they're waging war in Ukraine. However, I think we need to warn the hothead in Washington that this could be the onset of a suicide pact, and I don't think that they necessarily want to go there. I think we also should recognize that what this new world order may portend is a retreat of the potency of the U.S. dollar with it being supplanted either by the Chinese renminbi or a basket of currencies. This is already underway, it seems to be, with the fact that we expect Saudi Arabia to begin trading its most precious commodity, meaning oil, in the Chinese currency. And if the dollar begins to retreat at the same time that the banking system in this country is on life support, not as of yet, but certainly signs are there with the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and the contagious effect that that has had in Switzerland with the takeover of Credit Suisse, then it seems that on the one hand, you would think it would lead to more sobriety in the North Atlantic countries. But for those of us who know the history of this block, it leads them to more desperation, which, of course, brings us to the latest 
bit of bad news, which is London supplying these depleted uranium shells to the Ukrainian proxy forces. Uh, this is the equivalent of a so-called dirty bomb. It's quite dangerous. It's an escalatory maneuver with consequences too ghoulish and ghastly to now contemplate. So once again, we need to urge and encourage the peace forces on this side of the Atlantic to put on their marching shoes because it's time to march for our very lives. As we look at that side of the chessboard, as uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski would call it, Paris is a disaster. It's uh, in, uh, uh, France seems to be in revolt. Germany doesn't, and, and the UK, if you've, the, over the last couple of months, or maybe just a, a small step behind them, certainly Israel, I've been, you know, watching, looking online, watching videos online, and it is just people in the streets. It's a complete, completely in, unstable. Couple that with the instability in the banking sector, it seems to me, and add one more thing, and even before the instability in Europe, the European vassals, as they were, still seem very reluctant to move on to China. China and to want to, that, that's going to be a hard pull to drag them into a conflict with, with China. So how does the internal problems and contradictions throughout the U.S. empire, you know, reflect upon, the, upon these, these issues? Well, to add to that litany, uh, if you pay attention to politics in Australia, you might have noted that there is quite a bit of upset in the ruling Labor Party with this new submarine deal that's just been negotiated, which will require Canberra, speaking of Australia, to put billions of dollars into the U.S. military industrial complex, this could well lead to an internal coup, an internal party coup against the Prime Minister Albanese. Likewise, if you look at South Korea, which is being forced into a kind of shotgun relationship with its former colonial master, speaking of Japan, that relationship is being pressed by Washington so as to have a united uh, Northeast Asia front against China. Uh, this is causing quite a bit of unrest uh, in South Korea. I should also say that uh, this uh, front is also targeting the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and that is not winning the government in Seoul many favors. And likewise, with regard to Japan, which is essential to the anti-China front, uh, there was hardly unanimity of support in Tokyo when Prime Minister Kishida showed up for his photo opportunity in Kiev alongside uh, Mr. Zelensky. Uh, in fact, uh, many in Japan have yet to forget what happened to Japan in the 1980s when you had this idea that Japan was in the passing lane when the royal palace in Tokyo was said to be worth more than everything in the United States of America. And what happened is that the United States and its allies, they ganged up on Japan with the so-called Plaza Accord in 1985, forcing Japan to revalue its currency, uh, basically leading to the lost decades of the Japanese economy from which it is yet to emerge. And so now, the Washington hawks are going a step further. They're not only asking Japan to wreck its economy, potentially, since China is a major trading partner, but potentially to give up their lives so that Washington and Wall Street can remain preeminent and paramount. Now, there are those in North America, and I say North America, meaning Canada as well, who might accept that bargain, quote unquote, that is to say, jeopardizing their lives on behalf of a tiny 1% in New York and Washington. Uh, but I dare say that that sort of so-called bargain is hardly what is being envisioned or being accepted in a good deal of the so-called allies of the United States of America. One point and then one question. The point is, you're talking about Australia and Paul Keating, the former prime minister of Australia, is to a certain degree leading the charge against this nuclear deal. And, and the reason I bring this up is because he has said very clearly, China is not a threat. And I think for someone from a country such as Australia, whether it's a current prime minister or a foreign prime minister, to make such a declarative statement as that, 
I think speaks volumes and is kind of a bellwether of sentiment that is to come. And you mentioned the Plaza Accords. Did China learn their lesson by watching Japan and understand the problems that can befall you if you develop too quickly, don't protect yourself in the process, and uh, follow the diktat of the United States? Well, with regard to Mr. Keating, I'm glad you brought him up because he's been on fire lately Mm -hmm. (laughs) with regard to attacking the leaders of the Labor Party, his party. And the kind of rhetorical slash and burn style that he exhibits is something that we need to learn from on this side of the Pacific. Uh, With regard to China versus Japan, I think it's fair to say that post-1945, Japan's military capabilities were, shall we say, restricted by their Washington overlords. Now they're being unleashed because there is this idea that Japan can be a spearhead against China. Uh, But I would like to warn the hotheads in Washington once again to look at the lessons of the Pacific War. Uh, As a one who studied and written about that conflict, it was not inevitable that Japan would lose that conflict. And it was only that Hail Mary atomic bomb that came up that allowed Washington to prevail. And even then, it was not inevitable that uh, Japan would lose. China, on the other hand, uh, has a military. The Central Military Commission is headed by President Xi. That title of heading the Central Military Commission is seen as, as important as being the head of the party or the presidency itself. And so I think that China, which, by the way, if you were to do a close analysis of what befell Japan in the past 30 years, you will see that that China uh, carried water for U.S. imperialism during that time, just like it carried water for U.S. imperialism against the Soviet Union. And those sorts of deals, those sorts of blinker deals by Washington, has now led U.S. imperialism to the brink of disaster. And now they want to throw their own Hail Mary pass to try to escape. But it could mean the extinction of planet Earth. Russia has been uh, meeting with Eritrea, Burkina Faso, um, and uh, there's been a, uh, a significant uh, forum in Russia lately. Your thoughts? we got about two and a half minutes. Well, this question of Africa is quite timely. It's quite timely, not least, because as I understand that the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, this alternative bloc, uh, will be convening in South Africa in a few months, and the right wing, in South Africa, which is mostly of European descent, I should add, uh, allied with their allies in Washington, are demanding that the Praetorian government arrest President Putin once he lands, which of course will not happen, but it's indicative of the kind of hysteria uh, that's unfolding with regard to not only this Ukraine crisis, but the rise of, of China as well. Likewise, The North Atlantic countries soared to preeminence and prominence in the past 500 years, not least because of their plundering of Africa. We are exhibits with regard to their plundering being products of the unlimited African slave trade. But now you see Africa is not willing to no longer play the role of the horse with the North Atlantic countries being the rider. And that is causing a bit of anxiety, to put it mildly in Washington, in Paris, in London, in Berlin, and it should cause anxiety because they should realize that the writing is on the wall, that the jig is up, that it's time to pay the piper. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, thank you so much for your time. We greatly, greatly appreciate that analysis, and we look forward to having you back. 